Tonight, would you please get the book of Romans opened up in chapter 12, if you would, please. Well, Pastor said everything I wanted to say about that magnificent song communicated so effectively, and we were ushered into the, uh, the truth of how much our God loves us. I thank the Lord for it. It's like I wanted to hit the rewind button or replay button or whatever you would do. I just would love to hear that again. That was wonderful. I didn't know that many little uh, kiddos were in the building. They, they're just so, so little, they must hide. And they sit on the floor or something. And when pastor dismisses, about 4,000 people got up and uh, li little pre-people got up and walked out of here and, uh, and, and got out of this place. So uh, that's, that's great. And I know the Robertsons have been a blessing to them. And, uh, and uh, they have certainly been a help to all of us in what they've done in ministering to, uh, to the youngins. Well... I'm, I'm short on words to express appreciation, not only for your attendance, but for your attention. This is a ministry that has uh, emphasized the preaching and teaching of the Word of God for years. And through the leadership and ministry of Pastor Henry, you have been well fed and, and extremely helped through the uh, preaching. And, and, and as he just said it, preaching has been uh, the king has been the master of importance here. Some ministries have gotten away from that emphasis, and I'm glad that you have not. I'm glad you wouldn't want that. And uh, I just am grateful for not only your attendance, but for your attention. So thank you. And again, I'm out of words to say what, how much I appreciate all the musicians and all that they've done. Uh, your choir, you, if you're a member of the choir, thank you, folks. I'm telling you, you truly are a ministry to us. And God is using you in a wonderful way, and I'm extremely thankful for the ministry uh, that you have brought to us service after service in communicating the ministry of song. And I appreciate the way in which you've gotten here early. Now, I don't know what you had to do to get here early every night to be prepared, but I do thank you. And all the other folks who've worked in nurseries, some of you probably have worked in the nursery and you're here tonight with us. Uh, probably counting your blessings that you're not in the nursery. No, I shouldn't say that, but I know uh, anybody who's working with children in another room were thinking, how much longer is that guy going to preach? You know, I'm just telling you. I, I love your pastor's energy. I, I, you're, you're used to it, and probably when I get up, you feel like I'm talking in slow motion. I, I'm telling you, he has such energy and just comes out of him uh, with such enthusiasm. And I think to myself, if I could preach like he talks and carries on, we'd be done in about eight minutes, and uh, I, I think we would be. But I'm telling you, I, I am grateful for the, the spirit with which he loves his God and loves God's people and loves this area. So obvious. And so this ministry has been deeply and, and uniquely blessed in so many ways. And so I'm very thankful for it. Thankful for the ministry of the staff and, and uh, Brother Tony. And hey, can I say this about what he was saying about upcoming youth events. If you have a teenager in your family, I hope that you're very supportive of the church youth program. I really mean that. I mean, if he's, I, this is great, what they're going to be doing on Saturday, going to be doing some work for the, the community. That's always a special youth activity. It's always very, very good. And, and I hope that you've got your young person involved with things like that. And then at the same time, uh, when they go to camp and uh, whenever they, I mean, if, if they're just going to get out here and stand on the parking lot and sneeze, I'd have your young person here. I really would. That was a joke. And uh, if you would get them, I, I, I'm very much a supporter of church youth ministries. And I'm, anytime a church has a Christian academy like this, it's sometimes uh, the thought that, hey, you know what? Well, you know, I got my kid in the school, and that's very good. That's very important. You may not have your young person in the school here. You may go to some other school or... Uh, are you homeschool? Whatever the case may be. But sometimes you look at your kids involved in a Christian academy like you have here and you think, well, that's sufficient. No, you need the church family gathering when the youth group gets together. Don't get me started on that. I'm a strong believer in it very, very much. And I know you love Pastor Aaron and Heidi and their ministry and their, their, uh, their faithful, uh, consistent ministry. He's always He's always smiling, and he's always a servant of the Lord, and I deeply appreciate his, his life and his ministry. Well, I could go on and on, and here I've taken, as I've said many times, uh, uh, just probably way too much time, but I'm thankful for you uh, for being here. Leave in the morning, and I'll be making my way over toward Pennsylvania 
for our next meeting. It'll be, by the way, uh, I, I put something out there on the table to, tonight that if you're interested in praying for us, you know how missionaries will have prayer cards? Well, I don't have a prayer card, and, and I'm not a, a, one of the missionaries you support, but I did, uh, did produce a, uh, uh, an itinerary for my spring. By the way, snow? Are you serious in the morning? This is spring. It's the middle of April. Are you serious? It's tax day. That should be enough for you to... Uh, okay. Uh, and so I guess you just kind of... You've had spring and enough of that. Let's go back to winter. Is that the way Michiganders look at it? Anyway, I have my spring itinerary printed up on a card out there on the table. If you'd like to follow me on the highway, my wife and I, you can follow along. It shows where we've been already and that we're here and where we're going. And it doesn't give you the full year, but it can maybe serve as a little uh, something to just kind of say, hey, Lord help him there as he's in uh, Pennsylvania or Indiana or wherever. I do that so people can pray for us. Secondly, I present, I produce it so I can remind myself, where am I going next, you know? And it'll help me pray for our safety and pray for the power of God to be upon our ministry. I love the work that God has allowed me to be a part of. I love the local church. I've been a part of two local church ministries as an assistant, associate, pastor. I've been a part of a church staff. I, I love the local church. And several years ago, the Lord told me that uh, my ministry was going to be to uh, go about and, and try to be a source of encouragement and a reminder and a revivalist to the local church. And so I'm grateful for that. There are several passages in the Bible that I think, in my vocabulary, in my thoughts, that I would call, and maybe other people would call, um, big, classic passages in the Bible. Now, you could argue, and I would not argue with you, but you could, you could say, hey, Mr. Preacher, every passage is a big, classic passage. Absolutely. And Jesus Christ is found in both Old and New Testaments. That is true. You take any passage and you run to find Jesus, you'll find him all over the Bible. But you know that there are some passages that truly are what we'd call big, classic passages. Can I throw some at you? How about this? Psalm 23. Would you not agree with me on that? Used at many a funeral, used to be an encouragement uh, in, in several places of a person's life. John chapter 3 would be a big classic passage, uh, culminating into that John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Genesis 1 certainly is a big passage. Isaiah 6 is what we'd call, I think, a big and classic passage. And so is Romans 12. Romans 12 happens to be the very first chapter I ever memorized when I was a kid. I was challenged by some of our children's leaders in our church to, to memorize it, and so I set out to do so, and I memorized it. But after the years of trying to be faithful to the Lord, I've discovered even more from this particular chapter of a section of the book of Romans. Most of you would probably know this, but the book of Romans is a book that is literally packed with a great deal of doctrine, teaching, gospel clearly presented, showing us how depraved and how wicked our heart is. When you start in Romans chapter 1, by the way, if you'd like to know what America looks like and where it's headed, read Romans chapter 1. It is in a whirlwind of a moral meltdown, and you can read all about that in chapter 1. You go through the first few chapters in the book of Romans, and then you begin to read how God has a gift for depravity, for depraved mankind. That gift is eternal life and forgiveness of sins. We also read about the gift of the Holy Spirit, and we read where the gospel has been clearly presented in this masterful writing by this man, Paul, the human author, as he wrote it to the church at Rome. Doctrine, doctrine, do heavy teaching. And then it's as if he turns the corner, as he does in every one of his books, and he says, but so what? If all this is true in what you and I would call the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans, so what should we do with what we've received? 
That's in every one of Paul's books. He would give you doctrine, the foundation, and then he builds upon it, and he says, and here's how it ought to be fleshed out in your life. If you'll notice in chapter 12 in verse 1, the fourth word of that first verse simply is the word, therefore. You could put it at the beginning of the sentence because it's, it's as if Paul, after the crescendo of chapter 11, he comes to chapter 12 and he says, therefore, because of everything I've been trying to teach you, and what, what you've been saved from, therefore, so can we read these first few verses? It says, I beseech you, therefore. To whom is it written? Brethren. By or because of the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office or function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing, According to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. That word also means liberality. He that ruleth, with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. The fact of the matter is, Paul is trying to lay a groundwork here for the church. Look, if you know anything about youth ministry, and I have been privileged and grateful for the opportunity to be around teenagers for all the years of my ministry. I love teenagers, I really do. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to minister to them. If you've been around teenagers and been around youth ministry and gone to camp services and youth rallies, and if you've ministered to them, you can pretty much bank on the fact that you have heard a message from Romans 12. Most teenagers have heard messages, especially from the first two verses, present your bodies, don't be conformed to this world, find the will of God for your life. It's clearly emphasized. And for years, honestly, I've seen that as a passage for teenagers. Then, once again, in my simple thinking, it finally dawned on me, this was not just written for or to the youth at the church at Rome. The Apostle Paul was writing to all of God's people. He calls them brethren. And he says, and I've given you really heavy instruction from, from, uh, uh, from the beginning of Romans 1. He takes you all the way through to chapter 11, and he's giving great deal of instruction. Then he says to all of us who've been instructed in the teaching of the Word of God, therefore, so what? What are you doing with your life? And so all of a sudden, I begin to realize this, this is not just for young people. This is for God's people. And I want you to note something here tonight that Paul is trying to, can I just say it like this? He's grabbing us by the spiritual lapels of our shirts and jackets and blouses and say, would you please hear what I've got to say? You say, I think you're kind of being a little overpassionate. No, my friend, that's what's wrapped up in the word beseech. It is a word that means I'm urgent about this. I don't know what kind of personality Paul had. You can read in scriptures and kind of pick up a little bit of what his personality may have been like. But it's as if he's saying, oh, please, please. It's, it's as if he's on his knees begging God's people to hear what he's got to say. 
So let's do it. In the uh, 19th century, you've heard me already quoting this week, and most preachers do, the great preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon told a story about a woman, elderly woman that had been a member of his church for some a length of time. And she was poor, and she lived in the poverty section of London, and that she was nearing the end of her life. Spurgeon told how that he went to see her, and uh, he went into this little simple home, a little two-room house, had a little kitchen and dining area and the front living room that also served as a bedroom. He said he went into this simple house, and maybe he told this story after she had passed. And he said, I sat down in a dusty chair, and she sat in the other one that was in the house. She didn't have much to show for her, her life. Nearing the end of her life, he said, Madam, how goes it with you? And she she said, oh, Pastor Spurgeon, thank you for coming to see me. She said, I'm, just, I'm just, uh, uh, just living out my last few days. And they chatted and talked for a while. And, and then after a moment when the conversation waned, he, Spurgeon said he looked around the simple uh, uh, place in which she lived and he noticed up on the wall of her house, uh, on the wall there was one and only one small little rectangular plaque that was on the wall, a, a framed photo, not a picture, but something was inside that frame. And so he stood up and he went over to look at it. And in there he saw a certificate, nicely decorated, some nice designs that had been on there and careful printing that was on the certificate. And so he stood there and he read the certificate. All of a sudden he turned around and he said, Madam, did you ever know a man by the name of, now folks, I don't remember the name of the man, but he, I'm going to make up one. He said, did you ever, did you ever know a man by the name of uh, William Brown? Oh, she said, yes, pastor. I, I knew Mr. Brown years ago. She said, yeah. She said, when I was a, a younger woman, when I had strength to work, she said, I did sort of a, a labor of taking care of people in their homes. And she said, I would go and uh, maybe fix a meal and and make sure that they were comfortable in their latter years. And she said, oh, yeah, I used to go to Mr. Brown's home, and I'd take a blanket and put it over him and make sure he was comfortable and maybe serve him a meal. And, and she said he was there all alone. He had no family. He was just there. And Spurgeon said, ma'am, was he a wealthy man? Oh, she said, you wouldn't believe his home. She said, it was beautiful. Oh, she said, it was magnificent. She said, yes, he was wealthy. She said, it was such a, such a shame for that wealthy man having no family. Nobody came to see him. But she said, I enjoyed taking care of whatever his needs were. He said, ma'am, have you ever read this certificate? Oh, she said, pastor, you know I can't read, don't you? She said, that showed up somewhere through the years. And she said, I, I just thought it looked so beautiful. I found that old beat up frame and put it inside that frame and put it up on the wall just to have something in my house that looked nice. And she said, no, I can't read that. I've never read it in my life. He said, ma'am, this certificate declares that when Mr. Brown died on such and such a date, <laughs> he left his entire estate and wealth to you. And here you live in this house. He said, ma'am, you're a wealthy lady. She said, now, pastor, don't tell me that. She said, that can't be true. He said, ma'am, that's what it says. Now, you understand this is back in the day when finding people were not as easy as what we find it today. In fact, sometimes I don't want to be found, but I get found on my phone and any other place, you know. He said, ma'am, you are a wealthy lady and you don't even know it. You've never known it. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why won't that ever happen to me? I, I mean, I, I know how to read. I could get someone to help me with that certificate. When I read and when I think about that story, I think to myself of what Romans 12, why Paul was so urgent when he was saying to God's people, do you see? what God has given you. He is saying, do you understand the opportunity to enjoy and to employ what God's gifted you with? He speaks about gifts. Now, we know what gifts are. I happen to like the word giftings. Maybe I think it paints the picture a little bit better for us as to what Paul is talking about. He refers also about the grace that had been given to him. He's talking about grace 
giftings. What does that mean? It means that which has been given to him and what has been given to them and what's been given to us when the grace of God has come into our life, when the Spirit of God moved inside, He brings giftings into your life. I read some of them in verses 6 through 8. I said some. You could also turn to 1 Corinthians 12 and read of more giftings. You could also turn to Ephesians 4. I like that one because in Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, we read about gifts given to the church in the form of people. Uh, he called them prophets, apostles, evangelists, pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. What, what's, the, what's he say? He's saying they've been given to the church to help build up, to help equip God's people for the work of of the ministry. Your pastors have been given to your church as equippers for all of you to be involved in ministry. And here's what Paul is saying. He's saying you've been gifted. I like what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4. He spoke about the gifts in two categories. He just took all the giftings and he broke them up into two categories. He called them speaking gifts and serving gifts. Time out. He's not saying that if you've been given a speaking gift, you don't have to get on your uh, hands and knees and serve and uh, clean the bathroom and work in the nursery. No, he's not saying that at all. Nor is he saying that you have a serving gift that you never have the opportunity to teach a class or give a testimony or do something. But he's saying that there is a particular leaning in your life of gifting. Friends, we have been gifted of God. I am looking at people who are gifted in this room tonight. You know, there are a lot of people who attend church. I said something about this Sunday morning, and I'm kind of concluding our time together to this week, saying that there's a lot of times people just attend church. And I'm grateful for people who attend church. I'm grateful for many of you. I'm not, I don't know of anything about your lives. I really don't, not really. But there are some people who don't just attend the church. They affect the church. There's some people who are a little touchy. They don't like change. Hey, brother, we, we don't need to be changing things around here. We, we don't need to change light bulbs. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to change the color of a paint. No, we don't need a new carpet. No, I just don't like it. And sometimes a business meeting is held, and I don't know that this has ever happened here. I really don't. But it's sometimes you, you know this is true. People in some churches, they'll say, oh, yeah, 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 I'm again it. No, I'm again it. Oh, you don't even know what it is. Yeah, well, I'm again, and I just don't think it's a good idea. They're just a little touchy about change. Some people are touchy, while other people are touching lives. Paul is saying here that life is to touch life. You know, there's one thing about, forgive me. Would you just forgive me on this, all right? I don't want to dwell on it, but there's one good thing about standing at the threshold of the end of your life possibly. Having to deal with cancer brings you to the awareness of, I don't know how much time I have left. One good thing about it is, I'm asking myself, Morris, have you numbered your days that you may apply your hearts unto wisdom, my heart unto wisdom to serve God? Have I redeemed the time? I've been given giftings from the Lord. You see, friends, when you read about the giftings from God, you've got to understand they don't really belong to us. They belong to the master giver. They don't belong to me. They don't belong to you. It's a gift. If you've been given a gift that's a little bit more visible and pretty obvious and, and people know you as somebody who, who serves in a particular way, let me tell you something. It's just a gift. It is a gifting from God that, you're, that you and I are both held accountable for in our lives. The fact is... We are to be stewards, caretakers, babysitters, managers of God's divine gifting. I'll tell you something else. Our amount of time on this earth is not determined by you and me. We're constantly trying to do everything we can to live longer lives. I know that. Uh, the vitamins and the uh, uh, good eating and the exercise and, and good health. People do live longer these days than they did in past generations, and I'm all for it. That's good. But you know something? My life, hear me, my life and your life is in his hands. And every minute and every moment and every day is a gift from God, and we must not waste our lives. That's what Paul is talking about. 
when he wrote Timothy, his good friend Timothy, he said to Timothy, neglect not the gift which is in you. He says, Timothy, I know you're gifted of God. God's people have been gifted. The master will reward you for your faithfulness in the use of your grace gifts. Now, you may sit here tonight and you say, no, no, Brother Morris, I don't. I don't have anything that I can do for the Lord. I'm just a, I'm just a retired person. I'm a, I, uh, I was a businessman. I'm a housewife. I'm, I'm a widow. I'm a widower. I'm, I've, uh, I'm young in the Lord. I just don't, I don't have the ability to do much. I really, I don't see anything in my life. May I say to you, don't minimize what God has done in your life. I mean that. You say, where do you come up with that? Would you go back to our text and would you notice, please, verse 5? Paul is talking about, he's making a comparison to the human body. In fact, he says in verse 4, back up to verse 4, for just like we have many members in one body. He's talking about the human body. And all members have not the same office or purpose or function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. And everyone... Members, look at this, one of another, ma'am, we need you. He says there, we're, we're, we're one of another in the body of Christ. That's why people ought to be an active participant in their church. I mean that. Don't just be an attender. Be a church member and then throw yourself in and say, where can I serve and how can I use what God's gifted me to be a blessing to the body of Christ, this body and to the overall body of Christ? Here's what he's saying. He's saying, don't minimize who you are. You say, well, no, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't work in children's church. I, I'd be scared to death. They'd call on me to pray, and I don't know how I could do that. Okay, then find out where you could serve. Don't minimize who you are. Stand up. Don't have poor posture. and Realize who you are in Christ. Don't minimize your giftedness. Secondly, he says, don't maximize who you are. Look at verse 3. What does he say in verse 3? He says, for I say through the grace that's been given unto me, here's Paul, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. What's he saying? He's saying, now look, you may, be, you may be in a position of leadership or prominence there in the church at Rome, or you may have giftings that are pretty obvious, but he's saying here, don't think that, you're, don't think that people can't function without you. Don't think too highly of yourself because it's a gift. Don't walk around with that Barney Fife. <clears throat> Do we know who Barney Fife is in this building tonight? You know, uh, you, know, I, you know, I can just about do anything. You know, this church would be pretty bad off if they didn't have me. I love Barney. Uh, he, he's not normal, but sometimes we get Barney people in the body of Christ. This idea of, yeah, yeah, you know, this church really needs me. Yes, we do. We sure do. But don't think too highly of yourself. Don't minimize who you are. And don't maximize yourself as some super Christian. And may I simply come include my opening thoughts by saying, and don't miss the giftings of God. Don't miss them. I mentioned to you there in verses 6 through 8, we get the list that Paul begins to list here. Now look, you may sit here tonight and you say, well, I don't have the gift of teaching. I don't have the gift of exhortation. I don't have the gift of prophecy. In fact, Morris, I don't even know what those gifts are. I got you. And I'm not going to take the time to break down all those particular gifts. And this is not even the complete listing. Hey, do you know, <laughs> I don't ever watch this guy. I've, I've glanced on him on TV occasionally, just turning the channel on PBS. That, that guy whose hair is, he's Bob Ross. He's the, the artist. There's, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, he, he, he talks like this. He, he just sort of talks, sort of whisper as he, he said, I mean, I imagine the guys that are working the microphone on that show, sticking that microphone as close as they can to hear him, you know? You know, if you'll watch him. I said I don't, but uh, anyway, he'll, he'll, take, uh, he'll take some of those colors. You know, they tell us, and I'm not an artist, they tell us that there are three primary colors. What are they? Red, blue, and yellow. 
And all other colors come as a combination of those three primary colors. And old Bob Ross will stand there or sit there, and, and he'll take that brush, and he'll dab it down in those water colors and oil colors or whatever, and he'll do a little mixing, and then he'll throw it up there. And you're thinking, what in the world is he designing? I can't tell what he's doing. The camera's right on that section. He'll take a few more of the design of colors and blends them together and designs it. And at some point, they back off the camera, and you look at it, and you go, would you believe the beauty of that picture? That guy can draw trees and a mountain range and a river. Not that I've ever watched it, but I mean, he, he is incredible what he has done by just simply blending. Look, the master creator didn't have to just work with three giftings, three gifts. He's got a list, and these are the lists we see in the Bible, and he takes it, and he goes, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make, I'm gonna make uh, uh, this man, and he goes, I'm going to take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and I'll put this in here, and I'm going to take a little bit of this spirit, a little bit of this activity, and this little bit, and I'll put this in this lady's life, and I'll put this in this teenager's life. Look, don't get lost in one, one gifting and saying, my one gift is the gift of mercy, you know, whatever. God has taken all of his giftings, and he's designed you. Can I get your attention tonight? There has never been anyone like you. Never will be anyone like you. You are a designer's model. You are a unique creation of God. You say, Morris, okay, what's the point? The point is this. Number one, pursue God's giftings. Pursue them. What do you mean? Discern them. Discover them. That's what Paul is saying. When he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies unto God and find out what you're supposed to be doing in the work of God, the cause of Christ. Don't just be a church member who attends church and gets up and walks out and nobody really has any impact out of your life. Don't be somebody who lives your life and when at the end of the journey people say, um, <clears throat> He, he, was a, he, he was a nice man. She was a, she was a good lady. Um, she, she, uh, she, she was, uh, didn't she bring some, yeah, some cook, she, she's a good cook, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. That's glorious. But when it's all said and done, will there be anybody else that will say, I'm a different person. Because that person touched my life. And maybe they didn't, even, they didn't even know what they did. But they impacted me. I observed them. I watched them. My daddy used to take me when I was a little boy. And he'd stand me up on the pew before the service would begin. And my dad, my dad was a quiet and kind of a humble man. He really was. He'd look around the room and he'd... he'd He'd spot some particular man in the church and he'd say, son, you see that man over there? Uh-huh. Son, that's a good man. He's faithful to his family, loves his wife. And your dad really respects that man. You see that, those people over there? And he'd bring out some other quality. You know, when I was a kid growing up, I realized my dad was being touched by it, though I didn't have it in my brain. I look back on it now. I realize there were people that were affecting my own dad. They were having ministry and didn't even know it. Why? I don't know. Maybe they said a word in the hallway of exhortation. Maybe they preached a message that changed the, his thinking. Maybe they gave mercy when he needed it. I don't know. But when it's all said and done, what will be said of you? You say, Morris, how do I pursue God's giftings? How do I know? That's a fair question. I've preached to teenagers for years, and I've said to young people, find the will of God. Can I, can I use this hymn book here and say this is maybe, maybe, for, maybe for a teenager, for a young adult, for someone sitting in church, been in church for many years, and you've never really thought, God's given me a gifting of some sort. And you may sit here tonight and you say, well, I don't even know what it is. And you're up there telling me I'm supposed, I've been gifted of God. How am I supposed to figure out what it is God's want me to do? How, am I, how, do I, how do I pursue God's giftings? He just told you. He told you in verses 1 and 2. What is it? He said there, brethren, because of the mercies of God. You discover God's giftings, ready? One step at a time. Number one, by salvation. He calls us brethren. Now, friends, can I tell you the will of God is for you to know Christ as Savior? Maybe that's why you're here tonight. 
if you've never taken that first step of receiving Jesus Christ. You're, this message will not make sense to you. You're not a part of what the Bible is calling the brethren, the family of God. And we'd love to invite you, please, in our human weakness, to be a part of the family of God. No, I didn't call you to be a member of the church. I'm calling you to be a member of God's family. If you don't know Jesus personally, come to him tonight. How do you discern what God wants you to do with your life? Take those steps, number one, of salvation. Number two, sanctification. Now, that's a word you hear preachers use. You say, where do you get that? When he said there, present your bodies, what's he saying? He's saying, do this. God, here's my life. You can do anything you want to with me. The word sanctified, the word sanctification, are you following me? Is a, is a word that means set apart. It's like these, this, this pew right here is set apart from your pews. You take your life and you say, God, here's my life. Apart from from the, the work of, and direction of everybody else. God, here's my life. I want to know what you've given me to be and to do. Do you remember in the Old Testament that little guy named Samuel? I don't know how old he was, but as a young man, here's what Samuel said to God. When God spoke to him, he said what? Speak, Lord. I'm your servant. I'll do whatever. I'm, I'm here to obey. What was he doing? He was sanctifying himself. There was a teenage girl by the name of Mary who one day was presented with a statement from an angel from heaven. You're going to be the mother of the Messiah. And you go read in the book of Luke where Mary said, son, this was big. This was huge. She said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. What was she saying? I'm yours. That's what you want. I'll do it. This guy named Paul, what did he do? In Acts chapter 9, he was walking and traveling on an animal on the road to Damascus to kill more Christians. And when God got his attention, he had two questions. Who are you, Lord? And once he figured out who, that, who he was, he was Jesus. He said, what will you have me to do? I mean, he got right with it. I'll do whatever you want. Can I ask you tonight? This is not for teenagers only. Has there ever been a time in your life, and maybe tonight you need to say anew and afresh, oh God, if I've got 10 years left, here's my life. Lord, if I've got 40 years left, here's my life. Lord, if I've got a week left, here's my life. I'm sanctifying. I'm setting it apart. I want you to use me any way you see fit. I give you my life. Would you do that? Can I say something just, uh, I don't want to say parenthetically, but I do want to address teenagers in this room for a brief moment. Young people, would you consider the ministry? Would you consider a mission field? Would you consider that God may want you in youth work? Would you consider God may want you in music ministry, camp work? Would you consider teaching in God's labor force somewhere? Maybe that's what God's preparing you. You're not a better Christian than other people. It just may be that God has gifted you along that line. Would you be able to say, God, I, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And if it's in the ministry of some sort for the rest of my life, when I'm old enough to do it, I'll do it. Look. You're looking at somebody that if you told him when he was a young person, in fact, when he first went off to Bible college, he was going to do what he's doing tonight, I would have said, you need medical help. There is no way I'll ever stand in front of anybody to preach. I was nervous. I was quiet. I was, I was, uh, I was kind of in some ways introvertish. I really was. No way am I going to do that. And I can remember going home. And at some, in the summertime, our church was having vacation Bible school. You know about that. And uh, I was uh, just there to just be a help any way I could that summer as an 18, 19-year-old guy. And some ladies came up to me at church and they said, Morris, we are working with the third and fourth grade kiddos in VBS. We would like for you to speak on Tuesday to these third and fourth graders. I said, are, are you serious? They said, yes. I said, I've never done that before. Yes, well, you can do it. I said, I don't, I, I, I don't think, but something was inside of me that said, I want to try. But I'm thinking third and fourth graders, that's, 
as I said a while ago, they're pre-people. I mean, I mean, how in the world do you communicate to that group? Their attention span is maybe three or four minutes. I mean, I can't, what in the world am I going to say? I can still remember that very first message. I remember. You know what it was about? <laughs> I spoke to them. I don't know why. Probably something I had read or, or in the scriptures. I spoke to them on Balaam and his talking donkey. Can you imagine trying to explain that to little third and fourth grade boys? I thought, I got to keep their attention. What in the world am I going to do? I went over and I got a piano bench and I turned it into my donkey. And I put that piano bench in front of those boys and girls. And I said, and so Balaam was riding on the road going to, uh, uh, to, to Moab. And he was riding, riding. And I started bouncing on that piano bench like this. And in my mind, I'm thinking, what am I doing? I haven't a clue. And all those kids were looking at me like, we do not have a normal man in the building. What is this? And I thought, this is it's the only way I can keep their attention. And then I got down on the floor like I was the donkey talking. And, and I looked up and I, I talked to the invisible Balaam. And then I stood up and I became Balaam. And Balaam was talking back to the donkey. And then I got back down on the floor. I had those kids' attention, but I was thinking to myself, they're going to they're gonna put me in a, a, a funny farm when this thing's over with. And, and when it was over with, I was so embarrassed. I don't even remember the intent of the message. Probably obey God. You know, just do what God tells you to do. I don't know. And when it was over with, at the, at the first chance I could get, I got out of that room and I made my way to my car in the parking lot and I thought, they're going to they're gonna ask me to never come near another VBS class. This is, and all of a sudden, I heard one of those women call me down on the, on the, in the parking lot. I said, she's coming out here to chew me out on the parking lot or to tell me I was going to be up for church discipline on next Sunday service. And she said, Morris, Morris. I said, oh, you're Yes, ma'am. She said, that was good. Well, then I thought she needed medical help. And I said, <laughs> you, got to, you can't be sick. I said, really? She said, it really was. She said, you kept those kids in the palm of your hand. She said, would you do it again on Thursday? And I thought, well, I... I can fast and pray another time and get myself ready to speak to third and fourth graders again. And I spoke again. And then I started getting asked to go speak to nursing homes and prison services and giving a challenge over here and a challenge there in college. And all of a sudden I found myself saying, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? I came here to learn how to be a medical doctor and I don't know what you're doing, but I... I said, God, I'm kind of enjoying this. If you don't want me to be a preacher, you better stop this. Lord, you, you know I told you you can do anything you want to with me, but I, I don't know what's happening, but I, I, you better jump in and, and stop me. What I didn't realize was he was giving me the desire to do it, and then he was going to let me fulfill that desire. And somewhere along the way, I said, I'm just going to do it, and it won't be my fault because I told you to stop me. <laughs> I went and changed my major in college and started learning how to prepare my Bible messages. That was my journey. I don't know yours. Could you say, God, I've been a member of Fostoria for X amount of years. What do you want to do with me? Lord, I've been on planet Earth for X amount of years. What do you want to do with me? How do you discern? How do you discover? How do you pursue God's giftings? Psst. Know that you're saved. Be sanctified. Be, present your body unto Him. Number two, not only pursue God's giftings, but number two, protect God's giftings. Look at verse two. What did he say? And be not conformed to this world. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove and discern and, and fulfill that which is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul is telling people of his day and of every passing generation this truth. He's saying, don't let the age of the world... Now, we, you've probably heard the word cosmos described in the, an old Greek word to describe world. That's not, that's not the word that's used here. It's the word that refers to the age the age in which we live, the, uh, the culture within which we live. What is he saying? He's saying don't allow yourself to be pushed into the direction of the culture in which you live. Don't allow the world in which you live to get you off track. 
Don't allow the world around you to be the entertainment that you pursue and the clothing that you desire and the music that you, you hang on to. Does it really matter what we're entertained with? Is, does it really matter? Does it really matter what kind of music we have in our heart and life and home? Does it, really, does it really matter who we choose as friends? Does it really matter if we're dressing culturally modest or immodest as the world would design? Does it really matter if we're faithful to church? Does it really matter in capital letters? And in the boldest font, I can say it. Yes. Of course it matters. Why? Because you've been gifted, man. Don't waste what God has given you to be and to do. Don't say, yeah, I love the Lord. Yes, sir, I love the Lord. But, you know, the things going on in the world, kind of, kind of enjoy some of the things going on in the world. And, you know, I'm just going to kind of hang on to both worlds. We live in a day, friends, hear me. I am not here. I am not here to tonight to drive into you my own personal set of standards with, it, with which I live. You as a child of God, have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And the Holy Spirit will blow the whistle when you're stepping out of bounds. I'm not here to tell you. If I could, look, if I can talk you into doing something or out of doing something, somebody else can come along and talk you out of it. It's not a man's philosophy and, and, and standards and statements of how you ought to live. I'm saying this. Are you living a Christian life that is truly a vision of the glory of God? Are you living at home the same way you live at church? Are you living at work? Are you living at school? The kind of life that people can see the reflection of Jesus Christ. We live in a day of, hear me, sloppy Christianity. I'm not talking about a tire. I'm talking about a, 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 a laziness to really let Christ be seen in us. I said it on Sunday. You don't reach the world by being just like the world. We're in this world, but the world is not to be in us. I used to look at kids when I was a kid growing up. I used to look at teenage guys that, that were so much more athletic than I was. I've mentioned how much sports meant to me. It was far too important at times. And I watched some of the guys I went to school with. They were so athletic. They had more skills and natural uh, skills personally, to, to, uh, uh, physically, to, to play a particular sport. They could do more in there with their little finger than I could do with my whole body. And then I began to watch them as they began to uh, head out on the weekends and honestly get drunk, get drunk and mess around with the marijuana crowd and mess around with the immoral crowd. And I, I used to watch them. And I, I, I remember sometimes they had to quit because they didn't have the physical strength to go on to play. And sometimes they were kicked off the team because of lifestyle choices and I used to think, man, what a waste. Somebody that could have been probably an athlete for some time to come. But I'm telling you something, I've gotten away from those wasteful thoughts. What hurts me and what concerns me are people who are wasting their spiritual giftings. You see, natural talent can be given to even a lost person, but spiritual gifting is for the believer. Don't waste it. Don't play with sin. If you're tonight, you've got some unconfessed sin in your life tonight, get it right with God. You say, how do I know? Holy Spirit's knocking on your heart right now telling you you need to confess this bad attitude. You need to get this bitter, unforgiving spirit at the altar and get it, get it made right with God. You need, to, you, need to talk to, you need to talk to me, the Lord is saying, about the language that you use about the practices and habits of life that are unpleasing to God. You've been gifted of God. Don't be conformed to this age. Number one, pursue your giftings. Number two, protect God's giftings. And finally, he teaches us here to perfect God's giftings. Perfect them. You say, what does that mean? Well, look please again at verse 6. He says, having then giftings differing according to the grace that's given to us. Stop right there. What's he saying? He's saying all of you, child of God, children of God, church 
uh, uh, folks who are in the body of Christ. We've all been gifted differently. We've covered that. He said the gifts differing according to the grace. Whether it is prophecy, let us prophesy. Prophecy is a gift that I believe is the idea of forth telling, not foretelling, saying, I can tell what's coming in the future. There were people in the Old Testament that had that ability. It's the idea of really kind of preaching. It's the idea of forth telling. Here's what the truth says. He says, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Verse 7, or ministry, that means serving. And he says, let us serve or wait on our ministering. He's saying, start serving. Or he that teacheth, let him, ser- let him teach. He that exhorteth, that's, that's encouraging and exhort. That's the idea of urging people saying, you can do this and encouraging people to do what they've been told to do. Uh, uh, he that giveth. Some people, all people ought to be giving. All people ought to be faithful in their giving. But he says, he said, there's some people have been gifted in this area to make more money, to make money, and they just have a heart to give uh, more than what other people give. He says, let them do it with liberality. He that ruleth, that's an administration gift. That's the kind of the ability to just orchestrate and organize and make things come together. He says, let him do it with diligence. He that showeth mercy, you know what it means, do him do it with a cheerful disposition. Here's, I said to you already, this is a small list, and you take it with the other list of scriptures, and let me tell you something, God has orchestrated and taken a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Maybe you see yourself in some of those things, and he puts you together. So he says here, pursue God's giftings, protect God's giftings, and then perfect them. You say, how do I perfect what God's given me to do? We just read it. You say, I didn't see it. He said, if you've been given this particular gift, did you notice that he said, get with it? Do it. You mean you get the gift of prophecy? Get to prophesying, prophesying, <laughs> preaching. If you have the gift of teaching, find a place to teach. You got the gift of, of exhortation, start doing it. You got the gift of mercy, exemplify it and do it. You know how you find, you know how you perfect God's giftings? Here it is, bottom shelf. Young people catch this. By serving. Just start serving. Here's, here's what it is. It's walking with God, serving God. Walking in the Spirit. It's as if a person is saying, Oh, I've gotten saved and I've been obedient in baptism. And now, Lord, you can do anything you want to with me. I give my life to you. And they just start serving. You know something? I guarantee you, if you'll just find an area to serve, whether it be here or in some area of ministry, you'll find yourself probably leaning toward something that is a part of the gifting that God's given you because it piques your interest. And you start serving in that way. And as you're trying to stay right with God and you keep you know, protecting God's giftings and keep your heart right with God, as you keep serving God, as the years go by, here's what it's as if you can turn around and you say, oh, that's what I do. Walking in the Spirit, that's what I am. I'm, I am this particular life. And I repeat. When it's all said and done, your life is breathed out its last and the last drop of your life has been poured out. Will anybody say, they touched me? Friends, you know that when you and I serve the Lord, get this, we, we do it, we serve, we, we do it for Him, not for people's applause. When you serve the Lord, it's not for people to pat you on the back. You may get some of that. But a lot of people behind the scenes may never hear a a word of encouragement. They should, but they may not. But we do it for Him. We also do it, ready, with Him. Did you know that He doesn't leave you stranded? When Jesus left, He said, I'm going to ask the Father, pray the Father, that He'll send you another helper, comforter, just like me. And He'll be with you. You're not going to be alone. Your task of winning the lost, your task of ministering to others, your task of making a difference in the world, (laughs) I'll be with you. I'll be with you to the end of the age. We do it for him. We do it with him. I love this. We do it like him. You know, Jesus was the embodiment of all the gifts. That's why we're talking about being in the body of Christ. And we do it like he would do it if he was here. In Acts chapter 1, Paul, excuse me, Luke, who wrote Acts, said this. He says, in my first 
treatise that I wrote to you, his friend Theophilus, he said, I wrote to you all that Jesus, listen, all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And it's as if he was saying, now I'm going to read, write you this book to tell you everything that is going to continue of the life of Christ. We do it for him, with him, like him, and we do it to him. I quoted the other day in the scriptures where Jesus said, if you gave a cup of cold water in my name, it's as if you did it unto me. You, you helped somebody in need, you did it unto me. Why is it important that we do it for him, with him, like him, to him? Are you ready? Because someday we'll stand before him. And we'll say, here's the story of my life. I did what you wanted me to do. I failed and I stumbled, and I, but I always tried to get back up and say, please use me. And here, here's my life. And the only thing that will matter is to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. My dad taught me how to play baseball. He loved the sport and taught me how to play it. Always wanted me to be an infielder, shortstop in particular. So I played there. When I was an eight-year-old boy, I was playing on the very first team that I ever played on. And uh, eight years of age. You talk about a difficult age to, to be out there with a bunch of guys. They could get easily distracted. Somebody could walk by eating a snow cone and, and you just turn and just look the other, watch that guy eating a snow cone. The ball would come and hit you in the head. I mean... And if you played in right field, now this is in when you're a little kid. If you played in right field, there's a reason why you're playing in right field. <laughs> they don't expect anybody to hit out there. Now, if you played out there, it's different. But I'm telling you, uh, it, when you're an eight-year-old boy sitting out there in right field, I mentioned the word sitting. I'd look out there, and I'd see, oh, I'd see that old kid out there. He'd just sit down on the grass because the ball never would come to him, and, and he'd be playing with grass. And, and sometimes he'd just lay down on the grass and put, put his ball glove on his face and just take a nap. We'd have to call him, hey, Billy, come on, we're back in the dugout, you know. We were playing one day against a team called the Red Sox. We had uh, uh, team names of the major leagues, and we were playing against the Red Sox. I was out there at shortstop, and I was ready to go. Get, you know, I, wanted to, I wanted to get the, the team out so we could get up to bat. Their first batter got on first base. I don't remember how, if he hit the ball or if he got hit by the ball or whatever, but he's over there on first base. Well, my dad had taught me, though he was not the coach of the team, my dad had taught me and our coaches had told us, whenever somebody's on base, you want to get that person out first because you don't want them to round the bases and to score. So you got to get them out first. And so I was thinking, I hope, I hope that next batter hits it to me because I'm going to get it and I'm going to throw it over here to second base. And I'm going to get that guy on first base. I'm going to get him out before he gets over here. We've got to get him out. Well, the next batter came up and he swung and the ball did come to me, but it was not on the ground. It was a fly ball up in the air. Well, that changes the whole dynamic. I watched the ball coming down. I started telling everybody, I got it. I got it. And in my mind, I was thinking, I hope. I got it. I got it. And... Uh, but out of the corner of my eye, I saw that Red Sox runner trotting down with great speed to second base. Well, you probably don't know, you probably do know this, that if the a team catches the fly ball, you got to get back, you got to stay on that base. And he's running down the second base thinking that he's got a free uh, reign to that base. And I was thinking, what is he doing? And the ball came down, landed in my glove, I squeezed it, out one. I looked at him on second base. I threw it back over to our first baseman. He caught it, which was a second miracle. When he caught it, he then touched on that first base bag. And the umpire, the most shocked man on the baseball field, looked at me and looked at our first baseman. He said, double play, two outs. Now, look, on our team, when we got one out, we almost threw a party. I mean, it was a big deal. To get a double play, it was huge. 
the team just went bonkers. I mean, ball gloves went in the air, and everybody, yeah! I mean, you would have thought we were in a special religious service. I mean, they were, this is wonderful. Our coaches were going, great job, guys. That's wonderful. Old Billy said, what happened? And, uh, I mean, we were, just, we were just all having a great old time pulling off that double play. But there was only one person I wanted to see. He was over there in the bleachers. I was glad for the applause. I was glad for Coach's happiness. But I looked over there in the bleachers, and there standing was the man who had taught me how to play. I wanted to know what he thought. And that big old smile on his face, a raised fist. And that's all that matters. Don't waste your life. One of these days, you'll be able to say, I, I, I was a false story, a Baptist church member. Here's how I served you. I lived over in this part of the country for a while. Here's how I served you. This is, this is the story. My, I took what you gave me and I did what I could. All that's going to matter is not the applause of man, the pats on the back of others but his voice saying, well done. You did what I wanted you to do. Would you bow your heads with me, please, for prayer? False story of Baptist church. Wonderful people, and I mean that. I told my wife on the phone more than once this week how much I appreciate this church. But are you being used of God? Are you fulfilling the giftings that God's given you? Could it be that tonight you need to talk to your God about the, the rest of your life? To hear his well done. Could it be that tonight there is a desperate need to take a look at anything that would hinder you from moving forward, onward. That you've gotten maybe a little bit sloppy. You need to ask for forgiveness about something. Maybe there's a need to freshly present your body and say, oh God, here's my life. If there's anyone here tonight, you don't know Jesus as your Savior personally. Can I pray for you? You're never going to know what God made you to be or wants you to do until you know Jesus personally. I will not embarrass you, but I'd love to pray for you. I will not point you out. Is there anyone here tonight that would say, Mr. Preacher, I don't know if I took my last breath if I'm going to heaven. Would you pray for me? I'd be glad to. I will not point you out. If you don't know that you're on your way to heaven, would you just lift your hand? I'll see it. You can put it down. Anyone at all? Don't be afraid. I won't embarrass you. Say, pray for me. Would there be any young people? I took a brief moment in the message tonight. Would there be any teenager that would say, Brother Gleiser, I don't know if God wants me in full-time ministry in the days to come. But I sense that he might. He just might. And you'd say, <coughs> would you pray for me? Again, I repeat, this doesn't mean you're a better Christian. It's just the gifting. And you sense in your heart, is there any young person tonight that would say, I think God may be calling me. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand? God bless these two. And this third one, four, five, God bless you. Six, God bless you. I don't know. I'm not the spirit of God. Let me tell you, keep presenting your body, your life to your God. I'm going to do something just a bit different. I think I did it on Sunday night. I want to encourage you to kneel if you need to kneel tonight. I'm going to encourage you to leave your seat and come tonight, all of you, anybody who needs to talk to their God on their knees and say, God, here's my life. 
I don't want to waste your, my life. I'm going to ask you to come and do so. But I'm going to ask the entire church group that's in front of me tonight just to stay seated. I can't make you pray. I can't make you commit a fresh, new, surrendered life. I can't make you do it. But I'm going to try to make it as easy as possible for you tonight. Just say to God, Lord, here's my life. Now listen carefully. If as a teenager you feel like God may be dealing with you about ministry and you'd like to talk with your pastor, let him know, that'd be great. If you want to come and share that with him, feel free. If you want to do it after the service, do it. But I'd encourage you right now while it's fresh on your heart. You don't have to. It's just a, an idea that came to me. He'll pray with you and rejoice with you. Tonight, right there where you sit, adults, young people, you freshly commit yourself to God and say, Lord, use my life. Don't let me waste my time on this earth. Let me redeem the time. And then, I hope you're listening, when you're through praying, I don't know that it's going to take long. I don't know what's on your heart. After you're through praying, then just stand up. We're kind of going in opposite direction tonight. If the person next to you stands up before you're finished praying, do not feel rushed. You finish, your you finish your prayer. If the person next to you prays longer than you, don't feel guilty. When you're through praying, just stand up. It's not a contest to see who's going to pray the longest. You take time with your God and present to Him what's on your heart. You just pray and then stand up. You say, Morris, I don't want to pray. Then you stand up anytime you want to, friend. I'm just trying to make it as easy as possible for you to take time with your God and say, God, here's my life. Again, or in some cases, maybe the first time.